The World Health Organization says it is pleased at China for loosening some of its toughest COVID-19 restrictions. Cities across China are now relaxing their testing and quarantine rules. WHO Emergencies Director Dr. Michael Ryan welcomed the change in China's current coronavirus strategy. Chinese authorities have announced the new changes in the wake of nationwide protests against these COVID rules. The protesters have also been demanding more political freedom in the country. Well, for more now, we want to bring in Sarah Cook. She is research director for China at Freedom House, a non-governmental organization aimed at defending human rights and promoting democratic change. It's good to have you with us this evening. This loosening of this zero COVID policy, does it um, answer what the protesters have been demanding um, or is, is this more to make it look better for Chinese President Xi Jinping? Probably a little bit of both. Um, I think it is a move in a direction that even a week ago, many experts were quite skeptical of, especially when we see it combined with some propaganda narratives, some seemingly moves towards a more aggressive vaccination campaign among the elderly. So it does seem that there is some kind of reevaluation of what the approach should be in the aftermath of the protests. Um, but we are still seeing in at least some regions uh, you know, lockdowns, pretty stringent controls, um, and in some cases still some some protests happening. Yeah, and China relaxed some of its restrictions after nationwide protests that we haven't seen at this intensity in decades. Um, public anger was sparked after a deadly apartment fire in Xinjiang province. Tonight we're asking, is China's COVID policy to blame for that? We've got an investigative report now by DW News. We want to take a look at that, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. The fire started on the evening of the 24th of November in Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang province. Most of the people living in the building are Uyghurs, a Muslim minority long oppressed by Chinese authorities. That night, 10 people died in the blaze. DW's investigative unit analyzed dozens of photos and videos to try to figure out what happened. We also talked to several sources who had had the rare opportunity of hearing from eyewitnesses. It's almost impossible to get reliable information from the ground. Just contacting someone who lives abroad is enough to get you thrown into jail. But for a very brief period of time, relatives abroad were able to contact their loved ones back in Urumqi, and they are the people we talked to. We located the 21-storey building in this neighbourhood. While we identified three vehicle access points, sources told us that at least two were blocked most likely to better monitor the residents' every move. On the night of the fire, those roadblocks prevented emergency vehicles from getting closer to the burning building. Firefighters were reduced to trying to operate from the road. As you can see here, the water barely reached the flames. But was that the only reason why so many people died? Shortly after the fire, these videos flooded social media. They claim to show doors sealed shut by local authorities as part of the country's zero COVID policy. Were the residents locked in the building? It's an allegation that officials refuted at a press conference. No doors were locked with wires in this community. All the doors of all the flats and the front doors were open. The pictures of doors sealed with wires posted on the internet are a malicious forgery and false. But that's not what our sources say. They tell us that their relatives living in the building told them some doors were in fact locked from the outside. We're not identifying them for their own safety. When a person in the house was COVID positive, they would lock the door from the outside. That's why some of the doors in the house were sealed shut. Then, when the fire started, the electricity was cut off. So people were stuck because the elevators didn't work and the fire escape was locked as well. They couldn't get out. Our investigation suggests people's anger may be justified. What we found throws reasonable doubt on the authorities' version of events. And two days after the fire, Urumqi authorities said they'd loosened some restrictions. But by this time, protests had already spread to other Chinese cities.
Let me pull Sarah Cook back in from Freedom House. Uh, Ms. Cook, let's, let's talk about what happened um, with, with, with this fire. We know that it happened in the province, Xinjiang. We know that there is the Uyghur connection there. And we know that there may have been people, Uyghurs or Uyghur orphans, living in that building. Does that play a role here, or could it play a role in why it took so long for firefighters to respond? Um, I mean, I think that could be a possibility in terms of just the general level of restrictions and security controls. I think more likely it may be that that was one of the reasons why you might have seen some of the more stringent types of restrictions on you know, the secure, whether the security or local COVID policy enforcers were going to let a uh, fire engine close or whether they felt that they needed to maintain stability to a more maximum extent than you might find in China and other parts of China. But the reality is that a lot of these measures have happened in other parts of China. And part of the spark of the protest is because so many Chinese people in so many cities could see the footage, could look at this situation, whether in practice doors were locked from the outside in this building or not. They knew of cases and other information where that had happened nearby them and very strongly felt this could have been me. And that's what's really kind of triggered the protests. In some cases, regardless of this particular facts, um, as though as your investigation shows, it does seem that there were some blocks within the building um, that, that may have in increased the danger for the residents there. And do, do we know who these protesters are? I mean, because we've, we're talking about nationwide protests, and I'm assuming we're talking about the Han majority of, uh, of Chinese who are now protesting. But there has been some... There have been some claims that the, the suffering of the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang is now being maybe used by the majority to actually demand change from Beijing. D do you see a, a cause and effect or a, a misappropriation here of suffering? Well, I think it's interesting because I think, again, the main motivation for protesters and I think the commonality are the COVID policies. And in fact, as risky as it is, we have over the past few months seen examples of protests actually in Xinjiang and in Tibet, um, including by local minorities there against the COVID policies. I think what we're seeing in other parts of China is again, the sense that, oh my goodness, this could happen to me and people taking to the streets more vociferously to demand change to the policy. But I suspect that along the lines, you know, there's maybe a breakthrough in some of the censorship and propaganda that surrounded the other horrific abuses happening in Xinjiang mm -hmm. and possibly more Han Chinese learning about them because now they're maybe jumping the firewall to access Telegram. They're getting access to more uncensored information because they want to know what's happening in terms of the other protests. And we've seen that in the past where China, there's some trigger that gets people to maybe jump the firewall more, but then they learn about a wider range of of issues. We've certainly seen that happening at Chinese embassies outside China, where you see Han and Uyghur protesters side by side, and some kind of cross-education happening there um, as a result of this kind of solidarity on a completely different topic. Sarah Cook with Freedom House. Ms. Cook, it's good to have you on the program. We appreciate your time and your insights tonight. Thank you. My pleasure.